Today, we will be looking at people who have been referred to in history as prophets, prophets of the past and of the present. We'll look at how the ideas and inspirations of these people gave rise to how our modern society thinks and reacts and legislates and loves. May we remember today that we each of us has the potential to likewise hear the voice of source in our own way and act upon it, that we each of us can have the courage to speak an uncomfortable truth for the sake of peace or be reminded that magic still exists in the world and its secret ingredient is joy. Namaste. <laughs> The chalice is more than a symbol. It is a point of orientation. The flame is not worshipped. It is honored. It is honored as a symbolic pathway to the self. May this flame ever serve as a reminder of the light within. May it grow brightest in the darkest of times and in days of joy signify ever more brightly the satisfaction of God. Oh, come the wisdom from on high, and order all things far and nigh, to us the path of for the second week of Advent is for hope. What is hope? Hope is the ideals and aspirations that have given light to people in times of darkness and strength and courage to people in times of trouble and defeat. Hope is the understanding that we have choices, choices in how we react to situations, to others, and to our own thoughts. Hope is saying yes to life, to relationship, to opportunity, and to faith. Let us pray. Gracious Spirit, give us the faith enough to allow hope into our hearts and minds. Hope is such a difficult thing to reach for. 
it is only the very first step toward achieving that which we desire most. May hope reign forever in our world, and may the fruit of our hopes become the feast of our tomorrow. Amen. We live so much, if not all, of our lives according to a set of rules that someone else usually came up with. However, we often don't realize it is we who pick and choose the rules we decide we will follow. We may not feel we have much choice in the matter sometimes. For instance, we could choose to ignore the suggestion against theft and go steal a car. But since jail time is a prominent likelihood of stealing it, we think of it as having no other options but to purchase one. And so we choose to follow a rule because following it is the more pleasant option, or the least hazardous, from the list of available options. How many options are really available to us? How many options do we know about, or are blind to, or are ignorant of? How much do we believe in the rules we follow? Let's define what we mean by words like rules and options. Rules are laws, or more accurately, suggestions that one chooses to follow. They become your rules. People can say, here are the rules, and they can use that word rules if they want, but until you agree to them, they're suggestions. Slightly different from rules are options. Options are the list of things we have to choose from when making our moment-to-moment -moment choices. Left or right, starve or steal, Buddha or Jesus. Take note that not all options are mutually exclusive. But when we increase our list of options by empowering ourselves, not only with knowledge, but also self-worth, our list of options grows. Left and right are joined by up and down, and sideways and, and backwards. Starve or steal are joined by get a good job, start a business, go back to school, go to clown college, join the Peace Corps, open a lemonade stand, invent something, produce an infomercial. <laughs> these are options which have been beaten and bullied out of people. They feel that these options don't belong to them, and so starve or steal are the only things left on the list which they actually believe are real. When we increase our list of options, Jesus and Buddha find that they have good company in Muhammad and Confucius and Gandhi and Madame Curie and Tesla and Stephen Hawking and literally thousands of prophets and masters and wise ones throughout the ages from whom we derive our own personal beliefs, all saying similar things in similar ways, but for different kinds of people and for different reasons, yet prophets all. Who knows what will happen to our spirituality, to say nothing of human society, when we increase our list of available options and begin to allow in the voices of other prophets into the conversation. Traditional religions would rather you only focus on one source for your inspiration. But those from more liberal traditions recognize the value of a little comparison here and there, a little philosophical reinforcement. Who knows what strengths we shall find in ourselves when we seek to discover just for the sake of discovery? Who knows what will become of us if we lower our guards and listen without resistance to the voices of others? No harm will come from listening. Trust that your heart secretly knows the correct answer already, and it will ring when it resonates with truth. Truth knows truth when it sees it. Listen for the inner bell. Fear not. Our prophets have had enormous challenges before them, our resistance to change chiefly among them. The first step was being shown that the emperor has no clothes. Once we started to see that incrementally beginning dozens of centuries ago, we began to develop a society, not without its consequences, where we will be free to question and doubt and even run away sometimes when the implications of the answers are too big for us to handle. But the last remnants of our collective innocence have now been lost and within this lifetime. It's a good but painful thing. We're already nostalgic for the times when we didn't know about all the horrors in the world. We haven't yet started putting the pieces back together 
and are only realizing now that we don't want to build the same things with them as we used to. It's a painful process, but we will get through it. The six sources of Unitarian Universalism are the places to where we turn for inspiration. They are our guideposts for a wider world. The sources are the place from where we get our ideas about how to explore other ideas. Our ideas to be kind to each other and to the world. Our ideas to resist tyranny, to restore relationship, to recalibrate our world toward a peaceful future. Of the six sources, the second source upon which we focus today is described as this. Words and deeds of prophetic women and men which challenge us to confront powers and structures of evil with justice, compassion, and the transforming power of love. In other words, prophets are a term for those individuals who have a message to share toward the effort of greater unity among all life. Today, we are encouraged to explore what they and others have said about their experiences and discoveries. Some prophets claim their message comes from God or other non-earthly sources. Some claim no special provenance at all for their ideas. They just share them without a claim of special origin and they let the wisdom speak for itself. For if it truly is wisdom, it needs no special origin to be identified and it can always handle scrutiny. And that ultimately is what constitutes a true prophet, not the source of their wisdom, but that it actually be wisdom. The message has to have value beyond its source, for who can say where inspiration comes? Who can definitively say with any surety where the Bible comes from or the Quran? For all we know, they may be the inspired word of God, but how can we know what even that means? And in the absence of knowing for sure, what do we do? What can we do when faced with something that may or may not be truth? One can easily counter with an old maxim, consider the source. And it's not inappropriate to bring that up. For when someone says something wholly outrageous, wholly unkind, uncalled for, unloving, we console ourselves by saying, consider the source. And that's exactly what we should do. We should be considering the circumstances of the one who said it. What we forget to do so often is consider those circumstances with compassion. For only hurt people hurt people. When someone says something that challenges you, including something you know absolutely to be wrong, don't resist it. Let it swirl around and even through you. Be brave enough to give it genuine consideration as an act of love. For though we sometimes fear being changed by what we discover, we may find that the change we experience might just be for the better. If you pay close attention to the six sources, you discover that none of them are answers to any questions. There's no doctrine here, no dogma, no commandments of do's or don'ts. The sources are not destinations of a journey. They are doorways. They're portals through which we may be radically curious and confidently examining. The sources should be tested. They should be poked, prodded, teased a bit to give up their advice fully. And we know this. It's why we turn from religions that can't answer our most basic questions. Some faith traditions can't tolerate this scrutiny, either because the individuals being asked who represent these traditions have not yet gained the courage to ask the question themselves, or they're clearly aware that the answer is tantamount to letting you see behind the green curtain. What they don't yet realize is there's another green curtain behind that one, which even they have not looked behind. They may not even know it's there. There's a conspiracy at hand, a higher one, and it is one of benevolence. But really, if a statement of faith is worth its salt, it can withstand any test with dignity and grace. It can answer your questions. If a statement of faith is worth its salt, it has the humility to know that not all answers are evident, and it can be okay with that. Sometimes we just don't know. 
If in the sometimes withering light of scrutiny, an idea loses its dignity, if it loses its grace, it's never been anything but salt with no flavor, worthless as anything but an abrasive, capable only of smoothing us to a polish but not destroying us. A true faith will have faith in itself, neither boasting nor proselytizing required. Good news travels according to the availability of good ears. Still, even flavorless or unloving ideas which do not pass the test, even ideas we find to be abhorrent, have the capacity to teach us discernment. They teach us the nuances of movement toward a more loving thought. We know how an idea makes us feel, and that, more than anything, tells us how to regard them. Negative ideas have value because they provide us contrast so that we may better know next time how to reach for the higher thought. Attempting to shield ourselves from contrast will not only fail, but is missing the point entirely. We've not been handed a world with contrast for no reason. A pinball machine will tell you as much. There's value to getting slapped in the butt every once in a while if it's for the right reasons. And if they are the right reasons, you'll know it soon enough. You'll learn which flippers to hurl yourself against on purpose to get where you want to go and which flippers amount to game over. Don't be afraid of prophets or those who say where they believe their inspiration comes from. It doesn't matter where it comes from in the end. All that matters is how what they say makes you feel. Do you feel love when you hear it? Do you feel inspired? Do you feel empowered to take a positive action, create something beautiful, care for someone who's alone? Then it may be a piece of truth. Keep trying it and see how it turns out. The Hebrew word navi, is translated as prophet, but it actually means spokesperson. A prophet is an enthusiastic spokesperson for an idea, nothing more. It doesn't even have to be an idea you agree with. A prophet is someone who believes in what they are saying with utter conviction, and they speak it with courage. But you still get to decide for yourself. Much like art and artists, What defines a prophet is not the quality of their work or even the truth of it. Like art, you have to decide if you are in alignment with it or not. If you're brave, you'll also think about why. If you're utterly fearless, you'll also ask, what if? You might be surprised at what your inner voice reveals to you. Be brave. Be fearless. You are safer than you realize. Most religions will tell you a true prophet is only a higher being communicating a message on behalf of source. Don't believe them. A prophet is much more than that and much more accessible than we realize. Be your own prophet. Turn to the writings of women and men who speak of uncomfortable truths and glorious human potentials and use them as tools to learn how to discern truth for yourself. Use what you discover to unlock your own potential to reveal truth. We each have this compass within us. We must first learn to be fearless and honest with ourselves in order to share the spirit of inner honesty with others. For if we can avoid telling someone else how to think and instead shine a light on their own personal agency to decide for themselves, that's the best type of prophet we can each of us be. Be at ease now and breathe. Breathe deeply and find your center point. Choose a spot within yourself that you imagine to be the very center of who you are. From this point, all that you are emanates. If you speak it, or think it, or desire it, or design it, or ask it, 
This spot is the very hub of all your reality. It is the flaming core of your being. Feel it become warm as you imagine it. But the irony is that it is already warm. It is already hot. It is already molten potential within us. What we are doing now is not warming it. We are acknowledging it. We are recognizing that there is always water behind the tap. It is our responsibility to turn it on. It is our opportunity to turn it on. It is our right to turn it on. Feel the warmth grow in your awareness and radiate throughout your body. Feel it pulsate with light. There is no difference between this light and you. This light is you. It is as much a part of you as your own heart, your own hand, your own foot, your own dreams. You do not need to control it. Merely honor it. For once you have acknowledged its existence, it will know exactly what to do on its own. And you're really going to like it.